Basic Brewing Radio is sponsored in part by the American Home Brewers Association. Get back to brew school savings when you join the American Home Brewers Association. Now through August 31st, join the AHA and choose a free brewing book valued at up to $24.95. Choose from Designing Great Beers, the ultimate guide to brewing classic beer styles by Ray Daniels. Brewing Local, American Grown Beer by Stan Hieronymus. Or, For the Love of Hops, The Practical Guide to Aroma, Bitterness, and the Culture of Hops, also by Stan Hieronymus. Get offer details at homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing. That's homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, August 25th, 2022. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Sherwin Santiano, who teaches professional maltsters how to malt at the Canadian Malting Barley Technical Center, is going to teach us how to malt at home. We can take our home brewing to yet another level of customization. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. And if you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs and our brewer's logbooks. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And many thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. This past week, Steve Wilkes and I got together to shoot four, count them, four video episodes. We survived, (laughs) and the beverages that we sampled were mighty good. Uh, Strangely uh, weird, the episodes got longer as we progressed (laughs) through the shooting session. Funny how that happens. Uh, We did two beers and essentially three meads. Uh, The last episode that we shot was about my my simple mead made with local honey and then, then flavored with tinctures. So technically, that counts for two meads in that last episode. Everything was really good, uh, if, if if I can be self-congratulatory. <laughs> Financial supporters will see early releases starting this week, uh, along with recipes and behind-the-scenes videos of uh, the ones that I made. Uh, that that was a lot of fun, and uh, we're good, good for this month and next month and, heck, maybe October. I don't know. Uh, speaking of fun, mark your calendars for Saturday, September 10th. That's when the parking lot of our friends and sponsors, Desiree and Dave of High Gravity in Tulsa, will be transformed into the annual Tulsa Craft Beer Invitational. I went last year. It was a ton of fun. And as you heard on the show, and it's hard to believe it's been a year since uh, that previous one, uh, craft breweries from all over Oklahoma will be serving some of their standards as well as some rare beers and one-offs brewed specifically for the festival. So check out tcbi.beer for details or, or look for Tulsa Craft Beer Invitational on Facebook. And I'm I'm hoping that uh, to be there myself wandering around with my microphone again this year. And uh, while you're there in the parking lot, you can check out Pippin's Tap Room and the uh, big and beautiful high gravity homebrew shop, home of the Warthog Electric Brewing Systems. And you can meet Desiree and Dave yourself in person. They can help you take the pain out of propane, just like for me. And if you go to highgravitybrew.com and use the code EBC75BB, you can save 75 bucks off your Warthog electric brewing purchase. Remember, September 10th, Saturday, September 10th, for the Tulsa Craft Beer Invitational in the parking lot of family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. That's HighGravityBrew.com. Okay, we talked about home malting a while back, but it has been a while. It's been a few years. Uh, Sherwin Santiano runs workshops at the Canadian Malting Barley Technical Center that train professional maltsters and others interested in the malting process. And he also gives the people that he trains tips on malting at home. Because watching the process on the smallest scale can help us learn about what's going on in the bigger process. Sherwin Santiano, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Nice to be here, James. You're at the uh, Canadian Malting Barley Technical Center, or the CMBTC. 
First of all, where are you? Uh, what do you do with them? And how did you get into all this? We are located in beautiful Winnipeg, Manitoba here in Canada. Um, actually, the way I had gone into the company was um, I was a co-op student at some point in time about seven or eight years ago. Um, and upon graduating, I just stumbled upon an open position. And here I am six or seven years later. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, you're in the technical side of things. Yeah. Um, so with my position, um, I look over obviously malt. I'm the malting technician here along with my colleague, Mr. Aaron Onio. Um, and we look over our pilot and micro malting systems. And you, uh, I looked at your website, CM, cmbtc.com, and you provide a lot of training uh, in small groups uh, to train people how to be professional maltsters. Yeah, so here at the CMBTC, we have one of the few malting courses um, globally. Um, and at the, our course, it's actually called the Malt Academy. Uh, you can find us on Instagram as well under Malt Academy. Um, and, uh, yeah, so essentially we, we teach and train, um, people who are in, just interested in malt. Um, it's, it could be somebody who is starting a craft malt house. Um, and sometimes it's, it's honestly just people who are in, who work at malt companies and need some training, whether they be new employees or, or seasoned employees, we get a whole slew of people um and even from breweries we we get a lot of people we get we get everyone under the sun really if i think about it <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah if you're interested in malt and you want to know more um we host this course about a couple times a year now you you, you emailed me uh saying that uh, you know one of the one of the things that you could talk to us about that you could teach us about was is home malting uh, yes. and, and I'm assuming that 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 it, that opens you up to, uh, you know, you're back to square one as far as, <laughs> as yeah. you know, if you do your own home malting, uh, the unpredictability of the malting process comes back <laughs> from the olden yeah. days. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, yeah, you can. So, yeah, it's it's a you're bringing it all back. You're you're. This is a couple of things with with home malting. Uh, why I think it is a very cool um, cool thing to add to your brewing process. Uh, it's it's that level of control. Um, it's being able to introduce um, another product within your product, essentially, um, and it's playing with that that I think generates different permutations of of different avenues that that someone can explore and. And I think it's a beautiful thing. Um, but in terms of how you're going to do that and replicate it, at the end of the day, let, let, let's take malting in its simplest form. Okay, You are essentially being a farmer. Um, you're growing the barley under con controlled conditions. How you get there, so this is a bit of an economics thing. Um, when you are smaller, you can handle... Uh, you can handle more, I would say, change <laughs> uh, without having to worry about economic costs, right? right? Because these are not gonna these are not gonna influence farther down into to your bottom line. And at the end of the day, as a home brewer, uh, you can buy the expensive hops, mm. uh, right? This this is affordable, <laughs> quote unquote, because you are buying at a small scale, right? Um, and whereas, whereas somebody who's even a craft brewery, maybe they can't buy the cool, um, super expensive hops because they, they need to care a little bit about their costs. So with home malting, um, although it is technical, it is a whole nother addition to figuring out, um, your brewing process. Cause it's another thing, uh, you can get by, um, without having to worry as much because you're not trying to meet a particular spec that could come further down the line when you're home malting. But what you're trying to do is just make a functional malt and then replicate that recipe. The beautiful thing about barley and malt is that 
when I process a sample and I keep everything the same, um, if I replicate that a second time, it comes out kind of identical. Hmm. It's it's really cool, and 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 this this kind of comes from just you know like at the CMDC we have micro malting facility and pile mill facility, but uh, when I repeat a trial or I use the same control sample, yeah, the malt barley. If if you just if you have that specific control, the barley will take up water the same. It will process similarly, so it's really nice to be able to just change a couple things. Where I feel like in the brewing process. Um, it's harder to have that control um, because you're dealing obviously even with the yeast and mm-hmm. the yeast is a lot more finicky than I would say the barley, to be honest. Right. Um, and that's because you're dealing with the microbe. And um, when you deal with microbes and you're dealing with small uh, things like that, um, time is very quick on their end. <laughs> right. Um, if you think a dog, you know, it's kind of like dog ears or similar to that. I mean, microbes <laughs> are just, they're just, you know, they see a million lifetimes before we see one lifetime, right? <laughs> so um, when when they want to move a certain way, they will act as a group. And when they act as a group, when they grow up to a certain size, they can really influence a lot of things very quickly. <laughs> so now with home malting, um, at the end of the day, let's bring it back a little again. Um, you're growing barley out you are essentially being a farmer who doesn't have to rely on mother nature. You are a farmer who can work on your own time um, and, and give it the proper water and and control the temperature. Really? It's just water and temperature Mm. yeah, (laughs) and air. And, and if you can, so uh, I'll bring in even a little thing to here too. Um, For those who are are unaware or where to look, um, there is a, a really wonderful Facebook group called Home and Professional Maltsters. Oh. Yeah, and it's a really cool group. I suggest a lot of people look into it. Um, it's relatively active. And it's, and it's great because you have a lot of home maltsters and even professional maltsters who have joined a group. Um, so there's a good slew of information there. Um, and people are just fabricating their own little systems. It's great. Um, people are doing small scale. Some people will do a drum. Some people are just, um, repurposing fridges. Wow. Um, and, and it's really cool. Um, and also too, if another resource, there's a, there's a gentleman over in BC, his name is Francois and he has a brewing beer, the hard way <laughs> website and blog and, uh, YouTube videos, etc. Um, and he's also part of that group and his stuff is really great because, he's doing everything as his name suggests the hard way and he's making his own malt. He's formulating his own recipe. So he's a great resource to figure out how to home malt. Um, but for my case, I like to keep things nice and simple. This is something that we actually showcase to people on our course is, is home malting. And, and the reason why we introduce it to people is um, a lot of the participants who come on our course I mean, some of them are maltsters some of them are people who work in a lab some people are grain companies some people are are um over on the breeding side of things so a lot of times even they're just brewers who are just curious about malt and how it actually works um but a but a decent majority are actually um people who are looking to become a craft maltster hmm. um and coming on our course uh they it's a bit of a chicken of the egg scenario because uh, you want to learn about malt, but you also want to fabricate a new system. <laughs> right. Right. So um, if you've ever known a maltster, and this is, I think, true across globally, uh, part of knowing what to do is because you have people there who know the system in and out. They have basically ironed out, what's finicky about their system, what are the downsides, what are the upsides, um, and and how they're able to make that product consistently for the past 100 years. Mm. Um, unfortunately, with a craft monster, they're, they're not going to have that because they're going to go in a little bit blind. So we introduced the home malting for, for essentially for craft monsters to figure out... Um, to get a taste of how to malt without having to make the mistakes on their bigger systems. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Right. And, and if they so, know what the process looks like on the small yeah. scale, then they'll recognize it. On the, it's, it's similar to brewing, I'd assume. You know, if you make a few batches yeah. of homebrew, when you walk yes. into a brewery, it's like, oh, okay, I understand the process. Yes. Yeah, that's that's essentially it because um, similar to brewing, you're, at least on the malt side of things, you're trying to figure out how does this grow? What am I looking for? I mean, you just see growing barley. Uh, it takes a while to get that 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 practice or that feel, right? And then and then you, you look at your malt analysis numbers, and then you start to adjust. So um, the whole malt is an easy way for you to just figure out your systems and what works. And and it, it, oddly enough, um, even if you have the identical recipe and you scale it up to a different system or you go to a different system. Sometimes it's completely different, right? Mm. So it's it's it, the whole malt is more just to figure out um, what you're looking for, so that you know when you go to a different system, you still know what you're looking for. <laughs> essentially, I talked to uh, I talked to the guys at uh, Sugar Creek Malting Company, and I asked them about home malting, and they they issued a word of caution, saying that uh, at a certain point in the process, if things go wrong, you can actually uh, create something that makes you sick. Is that something yes. that we need to worry about? Yes. So a uh, caveat to home malting that I want to put out there is uh, um, similar to a maltster. And if you're going to take up home malting, you also need to take those considerations. Uh, you're going to care about your barley selection. So if you are going to home malt, you want to ensure that you have selectable malt barley grade. Um and and what James is mentioning here is uh, he's referring to something called vomitoxin. It's just a toxin um, produced by um, a species of microbe called fusarium, and they're going to produce this toxin. So if you ever see pink kernels, uh, you want to stay away from that, uh, and you want to stay away from barley that has been exposed to to high amount of moisture, especially during harvest. Mm. Okay. Um, obviously water is good for barley in the growing season, but, um, it's at that point of harvest that, uh, if it gets rained on, et cetera, um, it can actually proliferate the fusarium species on there. So, um, if, as long as it looks super yellow, if it looks super yellow, you know, that it probably didn't get rained on. You can just tell, you'll always know, um, uh, pre-sprouted. So another thing too is you, you want you don't want pre-sprouted barley as well because it's going to molt kind of weird, um, and it also might start losing germination over time. That makes um, sense. So stay away from stained barley, um, but try to somehow find. I don't know how you're going to do. It. I didn't think that far enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you have a farmer who's who's sold malt grade barley that was selected for, and you look at it, and it's completely yellow um looks like a golden sunshine uh then honestly i think you'd be pretty good to go um and and like i said this is a this is obviously a concern for for brewers and maltsters so they're always watching for this so I, but don't I, look pink. I, I malted a, a very small like half a pound of of barley just you know just for the heck of it uh, yeah. several years ago, and I, I got it from a seed company. Um, yes. Now, you know, that's it's probably not practical to get a whole bunch from a seed. It's probably going to be a lot more expensive than other sources. Uh, yeah. But I'm assuming that, you know, if you're if you're going to want to use barley for seed, uh, that they would they would take care of it in such a way that it would not, you know, have encountered these kinds of problems. Yeah, in a general sense, um, so for seed production, um, what they really care about there is is whether the barley, um, I guess what they really care, they care about the germination of it. They don't, I guess in a very technical sense, they do not actually care if, if it has fusarium levels on it. Um, but it tends to be the, what they care about a, a lot too is purity because they want the variety to be very specific. Mm. So when a farmer is grown out um, that malt barley, um, it is 
that's what they always ensure is varietal purity, uh, varietal purity and germination. So um, it tends to be very good and clean seed. So they go through different levels. Be uns- if you're unsure, it's like food. If you're unsure, just throw it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If it looks really good, I mean, you, you'll know what I'm talking about when you see really good barley is it, it doesn't feel like there's any black on it at all. Mm. And you should be you should be pretty good. So look for the staining. There's no staining and it looks pretty gold. But look at where your sources are coming from. Um, and, and, and like I said, uh, I haven't really thought about how you guys are going to source it. Maybe you ask the homebrew shop. <laughs> yeah. Can you carry barley? No, but no, I'm just joking. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know what you sell it for, but <laughs> yeah, yeah be an option. <laughs> This past weekend, I ate some 30-year-old wedding cake. You know how you're, you're supposed to save some of your cake for a year in the freezer and, and bring it out on your first anniversary for good luck? Well, we kept forgetting. <laughs> for, for 29 years, we forgot. <laughs> Until this year, a 30th anniversary. I dug it out of the freezer, literally, and uh, thawed it out, and it took a taste. The cake itself was pretty dry, and the icing was crunchy, but it actually tasted pretty good. And it didn't die. (laughs) But the reason I bring this up is because I made a cream ale uh, to celebrate the occasion with A44 Kviking from our friends and sponsors at Imperial Organic Yeast in celebration of that big day. I fermented at basement temperature, 72 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, around 22 degrees uh, Celsius, which is a departure uh, I usually, you know, brew outside in the hot summertime heat or, you know, ferment outside with Kvik. But the Kviking kicked off more slowly than if I had pitched in the summer heat. But it was bubbling before bedtime, and it was pretty much done fermenting in about four days. And Steve and I sampled that beer for the video, uh, show, the video that you'll see later this week uh, if you are a, a Patreon member. Uh but we, we sample that eight days after brewing. Super clean and delicious. Just a week after brewing. I love kvik. I love kviking. Now Imperial has a new hybrid yeast that's a cross between juice, an English strain, and Loki, a kvik strain. And that hybrid is I-22 Capri. It's not a blend. It's an actual gener- a genetic uh, hybrid. I made a hoppy beer with Capri that was delicious. And Steve made a mead, which fermented very well and was also very tasty. So Capri is very versatile. Not a surprise coming from Imperial Organic Yeast. I like to say my stir plate is dusty because I don't use it anymore to make starters for moderate gravity five-gallon batches. Ask your local homebrew store about I-22 Capri, A44 Kviking uh, from Imperial Organic Yeast. And check them out at imperialyeast.com. That's Imperial Yeast. Dot com. So, so what kind of so what kind of equipment are we going to oh, need yeah. if we're if we're going to uh, malt our own grain at home? Yeah. So um, these are set of instructions that that um, I've kind of given out to homebrewers before too. I mean, uh, you want so for the malting process, there's about three steps. Just for those who are unaware. Um, First step is called steeping. As the name suggests, you're just giving it water. Okay. Um, but you're not just giving it water. It almost feels like you're drowning the barley. Mm. Okay. You're steeping it as the name suggests. Um, and then you're going to be draining the barley after a given amount of time. And then you're going to steep it again. And you're, all you're trying to do is bring the moisture percentage. Um, at the end of the steeping, when you achieve the moisture percentage you want, the next step is called germination. And with germination, you are effectively controlling the growth of it using temperature, air, and water to make sure that it it doesn't lose that moisture that you just gave it. You just want to keep it around there, and you effectively want to grow it to a specific stage of that life cycle. What I would suggest to home brewers, because obviously you guys don't have the experience, nor are you going to have the technical capabilities to actually analyze your malt um i give a general guideline that uh what you're going to be looking for is something called the acrospire on the barley kernel um 
and this thing will essentially become the basically the stem or the shoot and it will form the plant Mm -hmm. so on the back side of the barley kernel if you ever open it up uh you want that shoot to technically be three quarters to the full length of the barley kernel um but to make it easier for you guys as long as it's protruding out just slightly slightly outside of the kernel that you don't have to cut it open or anything that's fine that means that you probably modified it well is it too much potentially maybe maybe the barley plants start eating some of those sugars um but that's okay at a homebrew stage that's fine now is yeah. that is that stage called chitting C H I T T I N G. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> Got to clarify that. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of jokes I hear all the time. Yeah, so, I've seen a T-shirt so the, or two. <laughs> yeah. the, the the chit is actually the it's it's more or less it's the coleoriza. It's going to be the rootlets, it's ah. the sheath that's going to form. So chitting. When people talk about chitting, they're actually talking about the opposite side. The other so, side. Okay. When you look at a barley kernel, the chit is is the little white thing that's going to poke out. That means the barley's germinating. So you're like, okay, great. It's chitting. Um, the acrospire is kind of like a ruler that you're always trying to see, well, where is it at now? Where is it at now? And that's what the acrospire kind of represents, at least mentally in my head, is where is the kernel in its, in its life cycle? So um, ideally you want three quarters to a full length. And the reason why they want that is because um, they know there's enough enzymes that the barley's plant has produced, but they know that they haven't eaten too much of that sugar. Once you grow farther than the full length of the kernel, you will start noticing that the acrospa will start turning green. Mm. Um, and that's not, that's, that's okay if it's a little bit green, but you don't want it to be green, green, because obviously now the plant is able to make its own energy. Um, and when it makes its own energy, it probably means it's starting to eat a lot of its starch reserves that you want (laughs) so so um but yeah that's essentially germination uh you are as a safe bet grow that acrospire a little bit longer and then the full length of the kernel and you should be fine and you Um, and the roots will come right out i mean it'll it'll look like little you know little octopuses or something you know the all the you know the, the roots will come out of the out of the seed and you know it's kind of it kind of might throw you off if you've never seen the process before because you've never seen roots in <laughs> you know in the grain bin at the homebrew store you know because they knock, <laughs> they knock all those off uh yeah. but yeah that's that's part of the the process too yeah yeah i guess people generally don't just throw in a bunch of seeds with water and let them grow right so it's uh, <laughs> except in um, fifth grade science class then you yeah <laughs> well you know you're normally used to if you throw if you're trying to grow a seed you throw it into the soil and then the roots start to start to grow into the, into the soil. Right. right? So right. Um, it's weird to just see that you threw, it would be like going to the home hardware store and grabbing a bunch of tomato seeds or something. And um, just growing them all in one vat. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's what we're doing. It's just, so, you know, it's a, uh, yeah. It's, it's, so, so yeah. So that's the germination step. Um you want to, you're going to want to grow it to that specific stage. And then you tell the barley plant, okay, um, I want to be finished. Um, and you're going to do something called the kilning step and the kilning step kind of what the name suggests is there's some form of heat. It's doing something. Um, but really what you're trying to do is just dehydrate the barley. Okay. You want to remove the moisture. Um, you're going to do that with air. You're just essentially blowing a fan through the barley. Um, but you're also going to want to have increased temperatures. So uh, these increased temperatures just allow for the water to evaporate quicker, essentially. Um, so that's the kiln step. Um, dehydrate the barley and, and so that you make sure that the enzymes do not get degraded um, and turn it into a functional product that the brewer can then use. And I think okay. I actually used a – my batch was so small that I actually used a food dehydrator uh, yes. to do that. Yeah. Use a food dehydrator. Um, uh, yeah, it, it works perfectly fine. That's actually what we use when we do our home all setup. Um, but yeah, so going back, sorry, I'm, I, I always go all over the place. That's the malt <laughs> process. <laughs> 
to do the small process, obviously a malt company has pneumatic systems and they got a whole bunch of other different things and they're doing it at large scale. We're going to scale it back as a home brew and as a home malt. So I'm going to start calling you guys home maltsters now. We're going to scale it back. And when we scale it back, we don't need a whole lot of equipment. Um, what you really need for the steep step really is a pail, mm. a container that you can throw water and a bunch of barley kernels. Okay. Um, I even have, um, if you work a nine to five, because uh, as I mentioned previously, during the steep uh, cycle, so the steep step, you are going to fill it with water and then you're going to drain it. You're going to fill it with water. You're going to drain it. Um, well, you're going to ask, Sherwin, how am I going to do that? I got work. I don't want to be looking <laughs> at this thing all the time. Uh, well, here is a step-by-step steep recipe that would work if you work a nine to five. And if you don't work a nine to five, well, pretend just extrapolate <laughs> to a different time. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what, what time you guys sleep. So, um, so for example, um, my recipe is very s- simple. It's just a 10 hour wet, 12 hour dry, 12 hour wet, 12 hour dry, and then 12 hour wet. So it's just 10 for a wet and then just a bunch of 12s. Huh. Now, what time do you want to start that? So fortunately, being in where I'm at, um, I'm always thinking about time that I start something and what I'm running my system. So this comes easier to me. But for you guys, at 10 o'clock, you can start it for 10 hours, turn to wet. Um, and that will take you to essentially 8 o'clock, 8 uh-huh. a.m. right in the morning. So right before you're heading out and you are saying bye to your family, you say, wait, I need to... I need to drain my barley, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so, yeah, so you're going to be draining it. And then from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., it will be essentially in a dry cycle, just hanging out. Uh, if anyone's at home, maybe they can mix it a little bit, but you're just essentially going to be uh, letting that barley sit. If anything, you don't want it to be too compacted, meaning um, – the barley might might start heating up. So if you could somehow disperse it into a different bin or, or a bin with more surface area, that would be um, very useful. And you're just going to dry it essentially. Now a mulcer would, would want to do um, they want to remove the CO2 and they want to control the temperature. But for you guys, you guys just leave it out in this in you know, out at home. Um, then, then you come home from work and 8 p.m., you start another 12-hour cycle. Mm. And if you continue this process, it's just going to go 8 p.m., 8 a.m., 8 p.m. And, and at the end of this, of this three-wet cycle, um, it will take you to 8 a.m. Uh, two, two days later, essentially. Yeah. At the end of this steep cycle, because eff- effectively what you're just trying to do is get the barley to the right moisture. And... Obviously, it's going to be impacted or at least influenced by the initial barley moisture. But let's say it's around 10, 12 percent. It should get it close to there (laughs) using this recipe. You should be hovering. And there's ways of determining moisture content at home. Uh, It might be a little bit tricky. I don't want to explain it over here because it involves math. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But essentially, I think if I can remember what I did, I, I weighed the dry seeds yeah. And then weighed them after they'd been, you know, I'd, I'd been through the soaking cycle. Oh, okay. And then figured, I guess... you know, figured out how much essentially water they, I, I don't know. I, I, saw, yeah. I watched a YouTube video somewhere. So, <laughs> so you can, so the thing, so uh, what James is mentioning here is a, oh, sorry, I'm saying James, like I'm talking to somebody else. And I'm just talking to you. <laughs> well, you can, you can talk um, to the audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can you can uh, you know violate okay. the, the fourth wall. Uh, that's no problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, yeah. What, what you're mentioning, so yeah, that 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 definitely works. So um, when you're taking up more, when the weight starts increasing, you know that that increase in in weight is probably because it's picking up moisture. So mm-hmm. you can just wait afterwards, and and that does work. The one caveat to that is that you're going to need to know the initial starting moisture. Oh. Because if you don't take into account, you'll never know what the actual moisture is. 
Does that make sense? Because the grain is probably the seed is probably not a hundred percent dry. If it's hundred percent dry, no. it might not, uh, yeah. might not be viable. <laughs> no, if it was a hundred percent dry, yeah, that's impossible. You couldn't even do that, even if you wanted to. We've got our our, our soaked uh, grain. Yep, and, and we've gone through our our uh, eight hour and then twelve hour cycles. Yes, uh, and now what? Yeah, so. Now you say to yourself, I'm in the proper moisture content. I did my math. I know everything. Um, now I am basically incubate. Well, I don't want to use the word incubate because I feel like that means hot. I am now watching my barley plant grow, but I have my eyes on it to make sure. So now you just want to maintain that moisture. You don't want to lose that moisture, but you're just saying to yourself, I want that barley plant to grow to this stage in its life cycle. So you're going to spend four to five days. Um, this is going to be dependent on the temperature that you're keeping the barley at. Um, it's going to depend on the moisture, whether you're losing too much or you're not spraying it enough. Um, and it's going to care about your airflow as well, too. If you're pushing a lot of air, you might start drying it out. So then, so those three things will influence where that plant gets to. But it doesn't matter if I'm over here doesn't matter if I'm in, you know, in, in cold Winnipeg or you're out in Vietnam or somewhere hot. Um, you can still technically get to the same place. Um, how you get there will be dependent on every monster. So as I mentioned, you want that acrospire to be a little bit past the length of the kernel. If you are there, then you could be pretty sure, and you're gonna. You, what you're gonna want to do is you're gonna grab a representative sample of your barley kernels, and you're gonna want to examine if that acrospire, so that's that shoot, um, how much percentage of those acrospires are greater than that length of the kernel, right? You want to count a hundred kernels if you can and see are there any kernels that are super. If you peel it back, the acrospire is maybe even half of a length. Then you know that maybe. Maybe uh, you're not providing enough airflow or maybe there's a dead spot in the kernels. So uh, the big word that we use here um, in the monster world, because we're dealing with all these kernels, is something called homogeneity. Mm -hmm. And we want everything to just, I want to give it the same treatment to every single kernels. And you, you guys do that in the same thing in the beer world, but you guys are dealing with the liquid, right? So the liquid is able to act as a singular body. Right, right. <laughs> when you deal with the barley kernels, uh, you want them to act like a singular body, but they're not because uh, all you take is one pocket of grain to not get the right airflow or it's grown too much rootlets. So you want to mix it. Um, it's a lot more finicky in that, in that regard. Um, it's not taken away from brewing. I'm just saying there's a slight kind of difference there. Yeah, is, um, is there... Is there a benefit to mixing mixing around the uh, the kernels as they're as they're sprouting, or do you want to leave them alone? Yeah, so you do want to mix it, um, and the reason why is so in a malt store world, the reason why they mix it is because um, you're going to get uh, a stratification, meaning the air depending where the airflow is coming from. So you're growing this barley out, and you're blowing air from the bottom. Okay. Now that airflow also has humidification, it has water droplets on it that you're spraying onto the air. Now, um, since it's the first point of contact from the bottom, the bottom tends to get more of that moisture. Mm -hmm. So you do want to mix it. And the way a monster will mix it is they'll have these screw conveyors um, that they'll bring. It's almost like a helix. And these screw turners will bring the barley from the bottom to the top and then throw it on top, right? And, and this will essentially mix the top and the bottom. So you want to mix that, but also why you want to mix it is so that um, um, barley kernels at the bottoms don't start forming too long of rootlets. Um, and the reason why is because it will start to mat up and form kind of like a little carpet. Uh. Um, and when it mats up, you, you restrict airflow. And then you start generating heat because the heat has nowhere to go because there's no airflow. Um, and, and that's just because um, if you ever deal with, 
if you start growing them more barley, you'll notice that the rootlets are going to travel and they're going to extend to the moisture in the air because it wants to get that moisture. So if it's if the moisture in the air is coming from the bottom, they're going to start traveling lower and lower. Um, so you do want to mix it. And, you know, if, even if you see something like a, um, a drum system, they don't even grow a lot of rootlets because um, you're constantly mixing. So the air is coming from it's attacking every kernel evenly that the rootlets never have to grow that long. Ah. So anyways, it's a bit of a side note. Um, but yeah, you're, you're going to want to mix it and you're going to want to spray with some level of water. And if you can, if you are an engineer or you're somebody who has a, um, a lot of time that you, you want to start designing your own system, um, you can implement some level of airflow, Right. Um, and some people will repurpose some uh, motors to just blow air or something. <laughs> so I, I, yeah. I don't remember. <clears throat> I know you know there are some systems that you can use like a box fan, uh, yeah. and, you know, and build shelves with you know like a, a screening uh, yeah. in them, you know, and have the air come up from underneath. I don't re- I don't think I got that elaborate. You know, on my little batch, I think I just may may <laughs> I think I mainly just like mixed it around a lot and spritzed every now and then you know it wasn't yeah you, <laughs> no it's 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 perfectly fine like uh, the, the, the reason why you need the airflow at least in a mod like in a pneumatic malt system is is because i mean you're dealing with such high levels of grain that if you did not dissipate that heat right um it would have it would just like the bottom would never would just be super hot and then that will you know and you're also using the air to to the there's that control, right? You, you want to keep the temperature the same. Um, and, and also the moisture. You, ha- you need a way to implement the moisture. Um, and, and some mold houses have it where to under, under screw turners, they, they have a water injection system that will, as it's mixing, it will like spray it on there. Um, but to make sure it doesn't lose too much moisture, uh, you want your air to always have moisture on it. Otherwise, you're just dehydrating. You're essentially going to turn yourself into a kiln Right. without without heat right essentially right right so so in our cases i mean this is where having a thin layer um helps uh yeah then making sure you keep up the moisture um spraying it every now and then don't spray too much uh you just want to have it mixed very nicely and as long as you're doing that i mean you should be fine and, and if you can keep it cool and the reason why you want to keep it relatively cool maybe your basement uh somewhere cool is, is because you want to you want to remove um microbial growth or mm. you want to reduce it mm. so having these lower temperatures really really make sure the barley grows whereas the microbes don't grow as much <laughs> so um but if you got pretty clean good clean barley uh yeah so it's not the biggest case but the thing to watch out for that i think even i run to when i'm doing a home mold setup is having too much water and even feel free at the very beginning. One thing I forgot to mention during the steep is to rinse that barley like crazy. Ah, right. Um, a big mold house isn't going to do that because obviously it's a whole lot of water and a whole lot of money. Um, but there are things that they do, but like overflowing it a little bit, but for a malt, uh, for a home mold or a home brewer, I mean, just rinse it, just keep, until it starts running kind of clear and that'll really help actually hmm. you remove a lot of that load off of uh that microbial load off of it and you remove a lot of the small material will also collect in the water um but yeah so that's that's kind of germination you're just growing it examining it making sure the roulettes don't get too crazy and making sure that the that acrospire is coming out and just tracking it uh what you can do is you can actually analyze every day and seeing okay how much more do the acrospires grow so what molsters will do um is they will actually take a representative sample and every day they will do their counts and see what percentage of their kernels are getting past a certain point so is it grown to a half length of the kernel to three quarter of the length is in the three quarter to to a full length so you grab about 100 kernels and you see where your distribution lies and you will see it's what's really cool is you will actually see the distribution increasing and moving up the different 
parts of the barley kernel. <laughs> huh. So yeah, that's uh, they call it growth counts, acrospire counts, but it's not chit counts. Chit counts you could run like when you finish steeping and you want to see if your kernels actually germinated. So that's another thing too is during steep, if you did everything right and you didn't drown a barley, um, you should have a lot of chits. There. The acrospires haven't grown because it's just the end of steep, but you will notice that uh, you're looking for that white. They call it the cholerizer, and it's going to protect the rootlets. And it's going to just turn into, eventually, the rootlets. Every week, it seems there's more good news coming from our friends and sponsors, Ricky and Kelly, from Groenfeld and Havoc Meaderies in Vermont. This week, Ricky says the fall seasonal Wild Hunt is available for pre-sale. Wild Hunt is a spiced blood orange and cranberry mead that's brewed in honor of the ceremonial meads of 18th century Northern Europe. At 6.2%, it's practically sessionable for a mead, a ruby red grapefruit color with an aroma of cinnamon, cloves, and allspice and the flavor of bright citrus, cranberry, cinnamon, and cloves on the finish. Kind of like a blood orange mimosa. Wild Hunt is a celebration of fall, which is my favorite time of year. Whether you like big meads like the ones in the ancient collection, very sessionable honey drinks like the honey spritzers, or deliciously drinkable craft meads like Wild Hunt, you can have honey-based deliciousness sent to you in most states across the country from Groenfeld.com. Free shipping for orders over 75 bucks at family-owned and operated Groenfeld.com. That's G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L. So, so at, at the at the end of, of germination, and you know, after your barley is your malt now is fully yeah. fully modified, uh, then you go to the food dehydrator and, yes. and and dry it out. Or, I guess theoretically, and we may not even want to cover this at this point. If you wanted to get super fancy, you could put your green your your wet malt into your yeah. oven and make crystal malt you could actually convert those use the moisture and the uh, enzymes in the the wet malt to convert those starches in the kernel into sugar uh yes. you know using using your oven and make a uh, make your own crystal malt well yeah so what you can do so it's a combination of things um Obviously, the thing with the dehydrator, you're not able to reach higher temps, and you're effectively using a dehydrator like a fan, because that's what a dehydrator is, really, right? Right, right. You have a fan there with air, and you're dissipating any of that moisture so that it, it leaves the kernel. So to add more technicalness about kilning, um, there are three steps to kilning. There's something called the free drying stage, withering stage, whatever you want to call it. And this is just... Um, that the barley kernel will lose moisture as long as you give it air. If you're just blowing air, the moisture will just evaporate just willy-nilly, okay? Um, that's a free-dry stage. Now, when, in order to get more of that moisture out, you're actually going to need to increase the temperatures, um, and this will effectively carry that moisture. It'll actually force dry they call force drying and it's it's just going to move the moisture from the inside of the kernel um out um and that's force drying when the relative humidity of the kiln drops you know that you've evacuated a lot of that moisture quite a bit of it six you might be at like six seven percent five percent moisture when you know that no more of that moisture is coming out, even if you increase temperatures, you know that you can then start curing the malt. So the next step is called curing. And that's where you say to yourself, I'm not going to kill any enzymes if I'm trying to make a pale malt or a base malt. Um, I can increase temperatures and start imparting that color and flavor. Um, so that's effectively how a base malt gets made. Um, if you want to start doing these specialty malts or different kind of malts, and you know, you're talking about crystals, etc., uh, the main differentiating factor is um, prior to what I was mentioning about you want to evacuate that moisture. Here, you actually want to keep the moisture. So, if you can 
you know, even with a dehydrator, if you can somehow keep the moisture in there, you either recirculate it back somehow, um, or you spray it with water. Um, this will make sure that at those temperatures, whether it be 50 degrees Celsius, I don't know Fahrenheit, I'll be honest. What would that be? Um, 50 is 100, around 120 something. Yeah. 120. Okay. Yeah. At those temperatures, um, you will be entering sugar conversion. Mm-hmm. Right. And the longer that you keep at that temperature, the more of those Maillard reactions you will get when you increase the temperature. And for those who are unfamiliar with the Maillard reaction, that's just that it's not technically browning, but it's, it is the brown color and sweet flavor that you get um, when you have a lot of sugars and amino acid or nitrogen compounds, those form the Maillard reaction and you add heat and water. Um, you'll get more of those Maillard flavors. Um, but also, too, uh, if you produce a lot of those small sugars, because the water, essentially what you're creating is a small mash. If if you if you can keep that moisture in, you're creating a lot of small reducing sugars, is what they call it. And these reducing sugars can then crystallize when you increase the temperature. Um, and then you get that glassiness. Right. So... Um, when you were saying to throw it right in the oven, the caveat to that would be that you need to, you need to keep that moisture in there. Um, how you do it. We've done it with a kiln where we've done some levels, like me and my colleague, we did, um, something in a kiln. So it was using that blower and that air. Um, but you, but the thing is we have a recirculation option in our pilot system so we can recirculate the water, um, back in so that it never gets removed off of the kiln. I guess theory, so, theoretically you could yeah. use a pan of water in, in, the, oh, bottom, yeah. in the bottom of the oven. That's a bread-making trick, I think. Um, but also don't open the door so much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when, your glasses, well, I, when your glasses steam up when you open the oven, that's, <laughs> that's moisture well, leaving. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, totally. You can keep pan of the water i guess the thing is too is you want to somehow get that water to go onto the grain i i actually i actually took some uh some two rows of malted bar or yeah, no yeah. it was maris otter some maris otter water right and soaked it in water uh yes. and then and then put that in the oven uh yeah. and you know sort of made my own you know kind of crystal malt and it worked it seemed to at least uh, yeah so yeah in theory uh it's, just, it's the same kind of a, along the same lines yeah, actually, yeah, you know what? That would be a better option. What I suggest is and not instead of recirculating it or forming, I think if you had that green malt, what you could do is actually have hot, well, not super hot, but like 60 degree water. Like, did you did you put it in, in kind of hot uh, water when you did that with the Maris water? I think so. I can't remember. I'll have to go back and look at the video. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> six, I'll, I'll six, watch it. 60 is 140. Fair enough. Oh, okay. 140. We're, we're, yeah. we're usually going in the other direction. On the, <laughs> on the I should have, yeah, I know. I remember, uh, yeah, I remember at some point in your plot. One thing too, James, I forgot to even mention this. I remember when I first got this job, uh, for me to learn about brewing, actually, I listened to your podcast starting from like, Whenever you start, was it 2005? Five. Five? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And I remember, yeah, that's how I actually learned about brewing was listening because I'm like, well, I can't listen to the technical talks because I'm just going to be nodding my head in agreement without ever knowing what they're talking about. So I I'll, should listen, I'll listen to, to a these podcasts. I'll listen to these idiots from Arkansas. <laughs> No, well, you, you know what, James, honestly, you got a great like radio voice. So it, it really made it easy for me to just put it on and just kind of, I would start learning a bit more. And I, I remember even, I think people were talking about, uh, they wish, I remember having a reader ask if you could uh, convert it into Celsius. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. And then I remember even, uh, yeah, even talking about Hurricane Katrina. So yeah, I really went right from the beginning. Wow. I listened to quite a bit of it. So well, yeah, excellent. A, I'm not, I haven't been a fan from the beginning, but I'm a fan who, uh, 
listened from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I started. Okay. We, so. we get, we get a lot of those. So I think, is there, is there anything, I mean, I think it sounds like we've, we've taken the process from, from beginning to end. I, I kind of, is there, I kind of feel, I tried to make my own tortillas recently uh, yeah. and, you know, they came out okay, but, uh, you know, yeah. there, it was such a, a, and it's not that complicated to process, it's just a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and it's and to be good at it, I would have to do it a bunch more. So I think I'm just still going to buy tortillas. But one thing, <laughs> but one thing that you know, doing the malting process, that's that little thing that I did, it really gave me an appreciation of the process and an appreciation of those who do the process. And if nothing else, it's a good educational opportunity. Even if you're not going to you know switch over and malt your, all your own grain for the rest of your life, it. It does give you an appreciation of where your your food product comes from. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's you know, it's going to make me sound like a like almost like a teacher who just you know, <laughs> if I get like one out of a thousand people to do it, then I think I succeeded. Okay. So <laughs> I do agree with you that that at the end of the day. Um, why not just buy it? I mean, it's, it's, this, it's, it's sometimes people say, you know, I'll buy the frozen pierogies. I mean, it's the same, right. Um, I do agree with that sentiment. You know, I'm not saying I don't, I make everything homemade scratch. So it's, it's, I know what you're getting at. Um, but I think, I think kind of, as you mentioned, um, I think home brewers or brewers in general, um, we've looked at so many of our ingredients, people get excited over it. And, and I don't think uh, malt gets it's, it's deserved love at times, mm -hmm. at times, not, not saying it's always, but at times I think, I think it has a bigger part to, to play than, than some people even imagine. And, and I think whenever I speak to home brewers, they really are so far removed. They, they know their yeast, they know a newer yeast. They know what are the yeast trends. They know hop trends. They know different hops, um, but no one talks about malt in the same way. Um, and it and it is its own little. Um, you know, we work in our own little vacuum at times. I think as people, and I think uh, I think malt is one of those things that why why care about it. And then I think there's a reason to care for it, and there's a reason to actually think about why it's cool. Cause I think it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is, if anybody's your target audience, it's this, I mean, you know, we could yeah. go out and buy all our own beer too. <laughs> yeah. And that's the same thing. Yeah. It's exactly it. It's just saying, well, why homebrew would be the argument. Yeah. Um, going back on what you're saying with the tortillas, <laughs> right? Like, well, why homebrew? You could just buy a beer and save yourself eight hours in a day. Right. <laughs> but we do it for the love of the sport. Sure. So I'm trying to say, hey, you know, why don't do a little bit more for the love of the sport? Sure. And uh, and home alt. And uh, yeah, if somebody can take me up on it. Shoot me an email. Send me pictures. Join the Facebook group. Yeah. Um, feel free to follow us on Instagram. But but yeah, and it's and, and we talk all about everything. Just just shoot us a note if anyone's ever interested. I don't care if uh, you're bothering me. I don't care. <laughs> You won't you won't bother me is what I'm saying. <laughs> well, excellent. And if you, and if you can't find how to how to get in touch with Sherwin, uh, send me an email and I'll, I'll I'll forward it on. Awesome. Well, this has been a lot of fun. Um, oh yes. I it's you know we've we visited we have visited this topic you know a time or two uh, in the past seventeen years, uh, but it's it's good to get back into it and to hear a different uh, you know a different perspective on it and. Uh, uh, I hope that uh, hope that we can keep in touch and and uh, you know hopefully maybe if people have enough questions uh, you know we maybe it's worth another uh, look. Yeah, do a little malt talk, <laughs> <laughs> malt talk segment. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, Sherwin. No, oh, thanks, James. Yeah, it's been an honor. Thanks again to Sherwin. Great conversation and tips. And if you haven't tried home malting, it's fun especially if you're a science nerd like me. 
Always great to know where your food comes from and how it's made. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long.